It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I am Lindsay Smith and I will be your host for today. We're taking Tuesdays with Lindsay one day later and doing a Wednesday with Lindsay. Why not? All right, today's show, we've got a really great lineup. I'm super excited about this. So we typically on Wednesdays uh, look at the markets and today is no different. We're absolutely going to dig into some markets for sure, but I'm taking a bit of a different angle. I will have, at the end of the program, you're going to hear from Bailey Elshinger. She's with Stonex. We're absolutely going to cover the corn and soy markets. We, of course, had some USDA numbers uh, this week, so we'll be tackling that. And I'm also going to ask her about Brazil. We've talked about Brazil on again, off again. You know, 10 years ago, they were going to be the biggest threat. And now it's like, huh, Maybe they are again. Totally going to ask her about that. So yes, we are going to dig into the markets. But I wanted to look at things in a slightly different way and focus on export markets. So I have two interviews lined up for today. Both deal with different issues. If you hadn't heard, Canada and India didn't have a great week. And that might be the understatement of the day. India is an incredibly important market for Canadian pulses, specifically lentils. But it's also been a very challenging market as it's one that has instituted tariffs on, off, very high, removes them. There's a lot of volatility in that. Now, in recent years, we've also had some diplomatic, how should I say it, um, rubs, let's say, between Canada and India. And our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, headed over to India and the G20 meeting uh, last week. Um, and it didn't go so great. And before that meeting even happened, the we got word from India that trade talks, uh, specifically about a trade agreement between Canada and India, had stalled. We don't know exactly what happened. Uh, Calvin Hepner and I discussed it here on the show. Uh, we're still sort of trying to dig in to all of what's happened. But the fact of the matter is we have an issue with developing an agreement, an early progress ag- agreement with India, and it's vitally important to our Pulse industry. So I'll have on Greg Cherowick. He's the president of Pulse Canada. He's going to join me later in the show to unpack how we got here, why this is important, and, and I want to know what he sees sort of the path forward. Um, do we have one? What does that look like? So that's that export market. And then the other, I'm always curious. So uh, last week, I went to Savita International, had uh, a field day, and uh, I was super happy to MC the event. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Peter Johnson, my colleague, of course, joined me there. And we had the titans of agronomy, which maybe you heard about on this on this program. Uh, it was a great day. And it really, it piqued my interest on the soybean export market, specifically the food grade market. So Savita is known for, of course, the food grade soybeans that they produce and shipping to our international customers. So I'm curious. I want to learn more. So I invited uh, Matt Renkma uh, onto the show to talk about that. So you'll hear from him uh, later in the show. And I'm super excited about this one because Steve Denise and I don't get to talk nearly as much as we used to. But when I started with Real Agriculture, Steve Denise was probably one of the first Ontario contacts that I made. Um, and he's with Mazex and he's going to join us for today's product spotlight. Um, and of course, the Canada's Outdoor Farm Show is happening this week. So going to get some some insight from him on Mazex products, their rebrand uh, and their field to field strategy. So uh, super exciting there. Okay. As always, you can give me a call, 1-855-776-6147, if you want to drop me a line and give some feedback on the show, uh, or you can find me at Real Loud Lindsay across social media, and of course, Real Agriculture across social media. Uh, you can head over to realagriculture.com as well. We've got all of our stories and tons of our audio and videos up there as well. Or, hey, subscribe on YouTube. All right, let's take a quick break, and I will be back with more Real Ag Radio right after this. Does your end stabilizer contain an active ingredient load high enough to be agronomically effective? If not, it could be costing you time and money. 
If you're putting down a nitrogen stabilizer, put your trust in Coke Agronomic Services. Solutions like SuperU, Tribune, and Anvil. Each delivers high active ingredient concentrations that low-rate products just can't match. Compare how imitator products stack up to agronomically effective solutions at defendyourn.ca. It's time for today's product spotlight and join me on the line, Tyler Gullen for New Farm. Tyler, it is time as harvest wraps up to talk about what we can do in the fall to save us some time in the spring. Number one, what's on our list? You know, that fall spraying could really be a great start for next spring. And, you know, in particular, if you can spray a soil residual product, uh, Valterra or Fierce herbicides, uh, they both provide up to eight weeks of residual control next spring to control those tough weeds you have, you know, if it's kochia, lamb's quarters, things like that, to, to really control them right as they emerge in the spring. You can apply them with a, just a regular sprayer and you don't incorporate them. So it's a really nice option to really get that true single pass for fall spring. And they do have a lot of cropping flexibility for next spring when you fall apply. All right. Where can producers find more information about Falterra and Fierce? You can go to newfarm.ca slash fall apply or give us a call at 1-800-868-5444. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on this Wednesday, September 13th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and this segment is brought to you by Alliance Seed and CDC Endure Oats. Top yields, excellent disease resistance, and the quality end users ask for all in one grade oat variety. CDC Endure is available through Alliance Seed Authorized Dealers. All right. If you have been paying attention to the news, you will have heard that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in India. He was there for a G20 meeting. He was also there for some side meetings, of course, uh, and diplomatic relations between Canada and India. However, all did not go incredibly well. Not Let's not even tackle the fact that the plane, of course, that he was supposed to leave on ended up stranding him there for two extra days. Can't help but feel like that was probably a pretty stressful couple days. Not exactly a comfortable place to be because relations seem to have fallen apart on the Canada-India side, at least at the top level. Unfortunately, further for the Canadian pulse industry, of course, is that there's been years of work put into a free trade deal with India that most in the industry were hoping would see some movement forward this week. Instead, things went a little sideways. Joining me now to tackle this very important topic is Greg Cherowick. He's the president of Pulse Canada. Welcome here, Greg. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to be here. All right. So now president of Pulse Canada, Pulse's kind of a big deal here in Canada. Huge deal in our export markets, especially India. Things, though, not going great on that front. So let's catch up first on sort of where we're at on pulse exports to India from Canada. Sure. Well, I mean, I guess in order to tell that story, we probably have to go way back and and start from the beginning. I, I like to say when I'm having these conversations, whether it's with our own Canadian government officials or, or with officials in India, that, that this industry grew in part to serve that market, right? We, we are in some ways built to serve India from, from the early uh, 1990s through to today. Uh, the growth of our industry has, has been dependent on servicing and supplying India. And, you know, over time, we actually got to a point where 40% of our pulse exports were going to India. Now, it's not the same market that it once was. We have encountered some challenges, and over the course of the last six years, we've been you know, facing a little bit more government intervention from the Indian side than we had over the past 20 to 25 years. But it's still a very significant market for us. It's our largest lentil market in the world. And from a Canadian trade perspective, you know, since 2015, it is Canada's single largest trade interest with India, accounting for almost $6 billion in trade. So still an incredibly important market, regardless of the fact that there's been some frustrations with respect to intervention over the last few years. Okay, whoa, $6 billion of pulse trade to India. Yes. Wow. Okay, so so that it does really bring it into clear and sharp focus, I think, as to just how valuable, even if, as you say, uh, there have been changes over the past six years, some pressures, some challenges, it's still a vitally important market, especially for uh, the lentil market, as you said. So that brings us to, to today. Where are we at now? What challenges are we facing now? 
So, you know, we've been involved in, and we as a country have been involved in a free trade negotiation and a discussion with them really dating back to 2010. Things got paused, you know, for the first time back in 2017. They were brought back online in particular because Minister Ng, Minister of International Trade, really leaned into this file. And, and throughout the course of the pandemic, made it a, a big priority to engage with her counterpart, Minister Goyal in India. And she, to her to her credit, you know, picked up a lot of momentum on this to the point where, you know, we were now back on in terms of free trade discussions and and uh, started pursuing what was called an early progress trade agreement. So, you know, for the better part of a couple of years now, we've been talking about that. And over the course of the last year, since 2022, there have been a number of rounds of, of negotiations related to this early progress trade agreement. So there have been nine rounds of negotiations and the ministers have met on numerous occasions. They're very close, uh, both traveling to each other's market a number of times. I think they've held over the years a total of six what they call ministerial dialogues. So lots of attention, lots of regular meetings and, and regular contract contact between the two countries and a lot of work on the part of negotiating teams to try to arrive at again, what they call this early progress trade agreement, which is not a comprehensive agreement, but it's meant to address the, 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 the few issues that, that, that will really give both countries a sense that we're committed to, mm-hmm. to a broader agreement and that we can make progress. And, you know, for our, from our perspective, pulses have to rank very high on the list of priorities for Canada and India, because, again, it is, you know, the single largest trade interest from Canada to India, but we also have a very symbiotic relationship when it comes to pulses. Canada has um, supplied over 50% of the import market share for pulses over the course of the last 20 years into India. Um, we traditionally supply the gap between what India can produce and what it can consume. Um, you know, this is a role that we have played for a long time. And in the context of our go forward relationship, that's the role that we envision playing for quite some time going forward. And that is, you know, to continue to be that sustainable source of, of uh, affordable, uh, staple sources of plant-based protein. So that's where we're at in terms of the, of the discussion. It's like, you know, many rounds of negotiation, but it's all around, well, what, what do we need to do to create those enabling conditions in an EPTA, an Early Progress Trade Agreement, to, to uh, serve that, that relationship? So put it in perspective, though, when we're talking about, you know, outside of this EPTA, what does Canada, what does product from Canada face as far as tariffs at times? So we'll face anywhere between 30% and and 60% in terms of tariffs on pulses, but those are, those are tariffs that are faced by all pulse exporting nations. So, and, and more recently, there was a disparity between the U.S. and other countries, but, you know, recently they were able to negotiate a, a change, and so the U.S. is subject to the same level of, of tariff that, that other nations are. Um, you know, and for the time being, uh, we face zero tariff on lentils. They need lentils, so the, the signal to the marketplace globally is that they're, they're open for business on lentils. Uh, the market is effectively closed on peas, has been since let's say early 2018, um, they have a quantitative restriction in place, which is a, a, a total volume that's limited to 150,000 tons. But on top of that, they've layered um, what they call price minimum price restrictions, minimum port of entry restrictions, all things that you do to ensure that you just kind of tighten up that market space. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for the two major exports that Canada has shipped to India historically, you've got some barriers in place. Now, I, as I mentioned, the tariff on lentils is zero. But the bigger issue there is since 2017, when we start we started to see some change in terms of, of Government of India involvement and intervention in the marketplace, we've seen that tariff go up to its maximum rate, drop down to zero, go back up to maximum rate, et cetera. And, and at one point, we saw it shift, I think, five times in a matter of six months. So it's that... Mm-hmm unpredictability and that lack of transparency with respect to the application of that tariff that creates, you know, confused signals in the marketplace and certainly doesn't send the appropriate signals to farmers in Canada and around the world with respect to, you know, what the biggest market in the world is doing and whether or not it's going to be in the market. So it is challenging. So 
that brings us to essentially the last, let's say, two weeks, because certainly we have seen some news uh, regarding the discussions between Canada and India. The Prime Minister was just there. There was a G20 meeting. Um, by all accounts, not a successful meeting, let's say. Uh, what happened with pulses specifically? Did, did we go backwards here? What, what happened? Well, I, I can't offer you any special insight as to what led to, you know, this idea that there needed to be a pause. I don't know, and there hasn't been a lot of discussion around, you know, how we ended up there. Um, and, and I also can't say because I don't, I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a negotiator, I'm not well-versed on tactics that you might employ as negotiations near the end. So it, it could be anything at this point that led to, you know, a, a high commissioner feeling the need to publicly talk about Canada's interest in having a pause. I, I, I just don't know. Um, I think what's more important from our perspective is that because, as I said, both parties have, have been at the table for nine rounds of negotiations, because there's so much time and energy that's been spent at both the political level and at the departmental level in getting a deal, that we find a way back to the negotiating table as soon as possible. I mean, this is, and from my perspective, this, this is about both Canada and India's interest as it relates to, again, the staple source of protein. This is, this is not just about Canada, you know, having an interest in, in accessing this market. This is a market that, you know, it may, I believe, that this year became the most populous country in the world. It is a market that is the fifth largest economy in the world with increasing disposable income more of that income is going to be spent on food in a market that's largely vegetarian. That means more spent on pulses. Um, their own projections would have, with, in, with rising income levels, uh, a doubling of, of per capita consumption, which could lead to us moving from 23 million tons of pulses demand today to somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 million tons in the future. All of that says... This is a relationship that's going to continue well into the future. And this is an important alliance in terms of, again, securing supply chains so that you have access to these products 365 days a year. That's why both parties need to come back to the table, because these types of agreements are about creating frameworks for the future. They're not about you know, being overly hypersensitive to what's happening here and now today. It's about creating those enabling conditions for the future. So, you know, our message to our own government, to the Indian government, and we are speaking openly with both sides, is it's time to come back to the table. Too much time, too much energy, too much has been put into to moving forward. Let's find a way back and let's sure, ensure that with this narrowing window of opportunity that we have to get an agreement, that we take advantage of that and do everything possible to, to bring, bring everyone together. So Parliament resumes next week. Um, Obviously, this is top of mind for Pulse Canada. What's sort of the next steps as far as with Parliament sitting? um, Who do you, you know, whose phone are you you calling every single day, pushing this forward? Uh, What happens next? Well, uh, no one's safe right now. I mean, we, we, <laughs> good for you. We, we're speaking. We're speaking quite openly with, of course, agriculture and international trade. Those are the two uh, departments that kind of lead the, this file from our perspective. Um, and you know, with a new ag minister, it's not so much about starting from square one because Minister Macaulay was actually active on this file when he was in the role uh, prior to to moving on prior to Minister Bebo. So he, he understands this file. He's been in India. He's been in high-level discussions regarding the Pulse file in India. So this is a bit of a refresher for him. So we're working with his, his uh, new chief of staff and his team there, and, and we'll ultimately be meeting with him to talk about the importance of, of uh, you know, making progress on this file for Pulses. And, and you know, it's, it's also... Yes, international trade is leading this deal, but there's an important role for the Ministry of Agriculture here, too. There there are other uh, moving parts that need to be considered, things like memorandums of understanding that, you know, that, that come along in, in, in conjunction with uh, these trade agreements and, and annual work plans that need to be looked at. And, and those would be something that we would hope the Ministry of Agriculture could um, 
you know, take a lead on from our perspective. So, so we'll be working with Minister McCauley and his staff. We'll be, of course, in close contact with Minister Ng and her team as well. Uh, the, the ag negotiators have been very good. They, they work with us on a weekly, uh, bi-weekly basis to keep us informed of where things are at. So, you know, th- those are the, those are the usual uh, suspects in terms of who we'll, we'll be working with. But beyond that, um, it's, it's every MP in this country that, that needs to understand the importance of, of free trade and, and in particular trade with, with India. And then on top of that, there are other industry groups that, that are very interested in seeing things happen with India. You know, we've got the Business Council of Canada, the Canada-India Business Council that's very active in these discussions. So, you know, we, we make sure we're in close contact with all of those groups so that they, they understand what we're saying and we understand what they're saying. And hopefully, you know, we're on the same page with respect to the messaging we're, we're, uh, we're bringing to Ottawa as well as to our counterparts in India. All right. We shall keep close tabs on this um, and see where it goes, of course, when uh, Parliament resumes next week. So, Greg with Pulse Canada, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks, Lindsay. All right. We'll be back with more Real Ag Radio right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab, to our local teams with boots on the ground. We are determined to get there first. Developing top performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. You know, there's a reason we call it the corn school. Videos on everything from planter setup, weed control, field trial results, yield strategies, and so much more. The corn school on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BSF, corn school episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest podcast today. Looking for robust, reliable grain storage solutions? AGI leads the industry in quality, innovation, and offerings to protect your investment. Designed for exceptional cleanout, superior strength, and unbeatable versatility, you can rest easy knowing your grain is secure in an AGI West Steel bin. With 100 years of manufacturing experience, AGI West Steel bins will exceed your expectations for reliable storage. AGI West Steel, long term safe storage. Find AGI at your local dealer. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio. I am Lindsay Smith, and joining me now for today's product spotlight is Steve Denise. He's the Director of Market and Product Development with Mazex Seeds. Welcome here, Steve. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Good to be here. All right. Okay, so Mazex has launched a new brand image for the market, and anyone who's at Canada's Outdoor Farm Show this week is going to see it front and center. What's the strategy behind this? Tell me how this all came about. Well, Mazex uh, has been in operation for 38 years, but five years ago we formed a joint venture with uh, Solio Agriculture. And when we uh, started into that joint venture, we wanted all of our customer base across Canada, whether they were legacy Mazex customers or whether they were the elite seed customers uh, with that brand, we wanted them to feel comfortable with the direction we were going. So we utilized the Mazex brand for corn and the elite brand for soybeans. And so after five years, we want to be able to focus our efforts you know, to make a better use of our, our time and resources and have our customers be able to more readily, uh, you know, recognize the brand in both corn and soybeans. And so we've moved to the Mazex brand across the board. And slightly different logo. Subtle change, but it's there. Subtle change. We went to a, a different darker blue. The logo is uh, fairly much uh, unchanged, but with the, with the darker color, we really wanted to speak to the richness in terms of, you know, the strength that the company has the strength that the company is going to have going forward and the investment that we're making both from the product front and, and from the agronomy front for our customers across Canada. All right. Tell me about your theme field by field. What's that about? So field by field, really, uh, some of it comes back to with the brand change, but, but what we recognize as a, as a, as a company and, and, our, and, our, and our team, you know, all the way through the company, is that for our customers on the farm to be successful – 
it's 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 it's, it's they have to be successful on every field on their operation, and every field will be different. You know, whether it's a different soil type, whether it's a different microclimate, uh, you know, fertility factors, productivity, and and so what uh, we do as a company in terms of our product research is to is to make sure that our products have a fit in those different scenarios or have a product line that fits in all those different scenarios on the farm. And so our goal is for a farmer to be successful, it has to be field by field on their farm. For us to be successful working with their customers, they have to obviously have success with our products, and that is also going to happen field by field on the farm. So that's really the genesis of how we came up with that team. All right. And now, uh, speaking of sort of making those decisions field by field and for each field, what trends are you seeing specifically on the technology side in corn and soybeans uh, sort of going forward in the coming years? Well, certainly on the on the soybean front, what we see is the transitioning of the herbicide technology platforms. And so you've got an Extend or a, a, a Canva-based herbicide platform. We've got Enlist now that is, is on the market and being active, which is a, a more of a 24D um, legacy background. And and so those both those both those platforms have a fit. Both those platforms, depending on the weed spectrum, uh, depending on the, the individual needs, and so. And, you know, we're working as Mazex with all of those herbicide platforms, and they'll be evolving again here the next two or three years to have additional herbicide tolerances. And so that's what we see happening on the soybean front in terms of, of the transition there. Certainly on corn, you know, we've, we've had a transition over the last 20 years from the first corn borer BT traits being introduced, and now we're moving into our first hybrids that have a SmartStax uh, Pro, which gives us another mode of activity on rootworm and allows us to, to work with our customers in terms of their uh, operations and so that we can manage uh, both the, the, the technology and also manage, uh, for example, with rootworm, those issues on the farm with, with something else that we haven't had before. Mm-hmm. So we do see this, this, this uh, timeline, and looking forward, we see you know, additional traits coming on. And then, it's, and then, Lindsay, it really becomes a question of, matching those traits up because the trait is fine in itself but if you don't have a hybrid that will perform on the farm both from a yield perspective and from agronomy perspective really you're still at ground zero so it's a matching of those traits with the right genetics really becomes the key to success absolutely all right so now this time of year of course is one of those that you know you start to see uh how everything played out harvest is upon us or wrapping up in some regions so we did have of course you know some pretty stark differences east and west uh and even within certain geographies taking all that into account what do you think farmers should be thinking about as you begin planning for 2024 well, certainly you just start planning for 2024, and it's never too soon to plan. And, and when we talk about planning, it's, it's you know, not only from a, from a corn hybrid or soybean variety perspective, but what are we doing on the, on the fertility side? What are we doing, you know, in terms of trait platform, depending on the needs in each field? And so it's, it's that time of year as we're into, into harvest or heading into harvest where we can utilize that experience from this year, look at where we're going to be planting on our fields next year and putting a a whole plan together. Because as you said, this has been a very different year. So we've got, you know, for instance, in eastern Canada, in Ontario and Quebec, we've got a lot of white mold showing up. How does that influence our variety plans for 2024? Or maybe more so, how does that manage maybe what row spacing we're using or what population we're using? Because that's going to be recency of mine. On the corn side, you know, we've got, uh, we've got uh, areas in western Canada where the, the corn is maturing ahead of normal just because of the the spring and early summer heat that was experienced, which kind of accelerated that whole curve. Um, so, you know, are we, what are we looking at for a hybrid mix on the farm from that perspective? In eastern Canada, it's the opposite. We've got, uh, you know, we had a rather cool spring and summer. And as we go into the fall, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to need a good month here to make sure that uh, that corn finishes. And so how does that play into our plans from, for next year, you know, depending on what the long-term uh, weather outlook is? Should we be looking at slightly earlier maturity hybrids, as an example, or as a percentage of our mix? And so, so you know, using this year is kind of, uh, you know, together with the historical trends to put together a really good crop plan for 24. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, you heard it here for, first. I am going to guarantee another month of great weather. So there you go. Come at me if it Lindsay, doesn't that, happen. <laughs> that would be just awesome. That would okay. be great. We had a good start last week i mean we had our first 80s and 90s of the summer really 
Yeah. So uh, no, we, I, I, I'm glad you're willing to guarantee it. That's yeah. Perfect. I'll do my best. All right. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Steve, for joining me here on the show. We'll be back with more Real Ag Radio right after this. Dedication. Watching the sunset over your crop is one of life's simple pleasures. The anticipation of it all. We know that feeling. Introducing our new Airflex NXT, our best honeybee header yet with the closest cut ever. Light, fast reacting, and infinitely adjustable. More yield, less time, and work. Airflex NXT focuses on the future. What drives your next? Visit honeybee.ca or contact your nearest honeybee dealer. The Advancing Women Conference, the National Leadership Conference for Women in Ag, is celebrating 10 years of bringing women in ag together. Whether you're a producer, student, entrepreneur, representative of Grower Association, or corporate agribusiness, invest in yourself in Niagara Falls on November 19th, 20th, and 21st. Visit advancingwomenconference.ca for more information and to register. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on this Wednesday. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and I know it's Wednesday. It's not Tuesday. What am I doing? I apologize profusely, but we had a schedule change. So just imagine it's Tuesdays with Lindsay, but on Wednesday. All right. Do you want true nitrogen protection? Skip imitator products for an agronomically effective solution like Super U Premium Fertilizer from Coke Agronomic Services. Super U protects against all three forms of loss and is proven to boost yield potential. See how others stack up at defendyourn.ca. All right, joining me now on the line, it's Matt Rankema. He's the Grain Business Manager for Savita International. Matt, let's talk IP soybeans. How are you? I'm good, Lindsay. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Okay, so the whole market, the whole food-grade soybean market sort of fascinates me entirely. Just briefly, if you could, from Savita's perspective, give me sort of the overview, uh, just how important the so- the food-grade market is uh, for Canada, for Ontario. Yeah, for sure, Lindsay. They, in, in Ontario, roughly... 15 to 20% of the soybeans are food grade soybeans destined for the food market in, in Asia, Europe, um, and a little bit domestically. Um, so it's, it's very important. The premiums that we offer on the food grade soybeans, um, are substantial, especially last year and this coming year. Again, we expect to be extremely high, um, which gives a great opportunity for growers, um, to make a profit on their farm and a uh, higher return on their acres. I, I don't even. Well, okay. So let's let's back it up a little bit. When soybean prices for just commercial soybeans goes through the roof, the IP market has to sort of play ball on that to buy those acres, right? So, so I'm that I'm glad to I, or sort of understand then at least that yes, IP soybean prices would have also been following this run up in prices as well. Does that? How does that work in the international stage? Is this a is this a you know premium product that our that our customers are going to buy even at those elevated prices, or do we stand to price ourselves out of the market potentially? It, it really depends on the market that you're that you're going into. Um, the, the premium markets, you know, when you look at places like Japan and, and certain places in, in Southeast Asia. They want Canadian soybeans. They want U.S. soybeans. They are going to pay the premium. They're not going to buy more than what they need. Um, like it's it's when premiums are this high, they're not going to you know get a long position and and potentially have to to store them into into the next year. They're they're going to make sure they get what they want, but but no more. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's certainly certain markets. Um, you know, this past year we we saw China pivot towards. Russian, Ukrainian, African soybeans to fill some of their food needs, which is some, a market that has has been and still is very important to the Canadian food grade market um, and soybean exporters. So it really it's really market dependent in terms of where they're going to go with, with mm-hmm. the high premiums and high prices. So now, when we talk food grade, we are exclusively non-GMO. Is that correct? Not not entirely. Depends who you talk to. For for Savita. 
Yes, non-GMO. Okay. okay, but there are potentially other companies that may offer GM varieties that could go into the food grade market. For sure, yeah. There are yeah. certain certain markets um, globally who who use GM soybeans for their okay. for the food grade as well. I just always think. IP beans, and I think about it here in Ontario, I think about the production side, and I just think about how much planning goes into growing these beans because you, you're you using non-GM varieties, meaning your your herbicide choices might be somewhat more limited or, or have some of these options. So obviously, yes, there's the premium for it, but the IP growers I know, they, are, they plan. They're long-term thinkers. For sure. I like. It's it, at the end of the day, it's still a soybean, and sure, the chemistry is is different. And I'm, I'm not an agronomist, so I won't get into the, de- the details on that. But um, I think I think IP growers who have success know what they're doing and and understand the the profitability of it, and and that's why they continue to to grow it on their farm. So you mentioned though that these are, I mean, these are premium markets for sure. Um, what are some of the? I mean, there's an opportunity there, right? But what are some of the challenges in in supplying these markets year over year? They demand they're paying a high price and they demand high quality. And I think, you know, it's a challenge. But the Canadian grower, we've we've been in this market for so long. Um, we have experienced growers of food grade soybeans that that know. The requirements when it comes to certified seed and quality across the scale. Um, the, the biggest challenge probably is, is Mother Nature, is what kind of harvest are we going to have? Um, are we going to be able to get the soybeans off dry and in good condition like last year? Or is it going to be, I hate to say it, but is it going to be like 21 crop where it just didn't stop raining? So um, that, that's the biggest question now. We have, mm. I think, a pretty good crop in the ground, and it's, it's just a matter of what kind of uh, what kind of quality comes comes off the field? Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't want it to not stop raining. So if we could put that out there, um, because <laughs> we've been dealing with that all summer. Uh, so we'll see. Yes, absolutely, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Now you did mention uh, some of our competitors. So who would be Canada's main competitors uh, in the in the markets we are focused on? The U.S. The U.S. is Canon. U.S. For example, in Japan. Um, they share of the imported food grade soybeans. Um, they share 90, 90 plus percent of that market. Um, so it is, it is certainly us, us and us in the U S I guess. Okay. So what does that mean then? So that brings me to, uh, and we've certainly talked about, you know, we've got different programs to, you know, differentiate product, uh, Canada is, has a sustainable soy program uh, that's coming around that we're certainly hearing more about. Why does a program like like, like that uh, exist? Or what does it need to? What does it give us as far as a competition or a competitive ad- advantage? Yeah, it, the sustainable soy program, um, which is really spearheaded by Soy Canada, is, is extremely important in order to maintain the market share and access to certain markets that we currently sell to. Um, competitively, the U.S. has a sustainable sustainability program um, in place for a few years, and we, as Soy Canada members and, and of the soy, Canadian soybean industry, we recognized that it was very important to come up with a program that was comparable and, and in this case, I think, uh, better than, than what the U.S. has. Um, which maintains our, our market access into those high value markets. So, is it something that customers demand? For sure, yeah. And it's it's not. I wouldn't say it's completely widespread right now, but I, it's certainly something that is growing in in demand every year, and and will continue to do so uh, as we move forward. Okay. So, looking forward, because. It is fall. Uh, we've got a crop to get through, of course, and get in the bin and off to these export markets. But we are starting to think about, and as we mentioned, IP beans take some planning. What's the outlook like for, for next year? What are you excited about uh, for the year ahead when it comes to IP beans? I, I think we have, uh, in the industry as a whole, and, and here at Savita, we've come up with a lot of new varieties that, we recognize we needed to in order to stay competitive with the yields that we're seeing with some of the new 
extend and 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 in, in the future of the endless beans. Um, and I think we and and an industry as a whole has done a really good job of introducing new varieties, coming out with high performing varieties that are going to compete on the farm. And so I'm I'm really excited to see how they do this year and in the coming years and and seeing the the uh, the growers and and seeing what their response is to that. Alrighty. Okay. And Matt, if anyone is interested in potentially growing IP beans or wants to know more about it, uh, where can they learn more about Savita International? Uh, they can go to www.savita.com or they can also find us on Twitter, Savita International or Facebook as well. Savita International there as well. Mm-hmm. And with plants in Woodstock, Ontario and Ingerman, Ontario, which I was at last week. Beautiful facility. Thanks for the invite. It was great. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Lindsay. (laughs) All right. Okay, Matt. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Big thanks to Matt for joining me uh, here on the show. I do appreciate it. Okay. We are going to take a quick break. uh, And then for our last segment, we're going to hear from Bailey Elshinger. She's with StoneX. And we are going to unpack the corn and bean numbers that we got from USDA this week. And I'm going to ask her about Brazil, about Brazilian production and exports, and why we perhaps need to be paying attention uh, to what's happening down there. Um, If you've got any feedback on today's show, be happy to hear from you, you can drop us a line on that feedback line, 1-855-776-6147. Or of course, you can find us on social media at Real Agriculture. And hey, we'd love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, All of our videos go up on there and hey, even some of our podcasts. So check it out uh, if you would. All right, let's take a quick break and I'll be back with Bailey right after this. At Brett Young, we focus on what's real. It's how we became Canada's largest independent seed company. That's why we're asking a real farmer, what do you think of BY6217TF, Brett Young's True Flex Canola Hybrid? What's that? <clears throat> BY6217TF, Brett Young's True Flex Canola Hybrid with Pod Defender Shatter Reduction Technology and Defender Rated Club Root and Black Leg Resistance. Uh, good yield, yeah. Probably choose it again. Thanks, Chris. Talk to your Brett Young retailer today to see for yourself. Brett Young, distinct by design. Introducing the all-new Zerion 12 Series Tractor by Kloss. Redesigned from the ground up to redefine the high-capacity four-wheel drive market with 653 max horsepower, industry-leading hydraulic flow, a silky smooth CVT, a powerful TerraTrack undercarriage, and a quiet, comfortable cab with 20% more legroom. More than just power. The all-new Zerion by Kloss. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Wednesday, September 13th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. This segment is brought to you by the pre-emergent soil active herbicides, Valterra and Fierce from New Farm. Get ahead of hard-to-kill weeds. Spray this fall for up to eight weeks of extended weed control next spring. Find out more about New Farm products at newfarm.ca. All right, joining me now on the line, I've got Bailey Elshinger. She's with StoneX. Bailey, how are you today? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's uh, it's hump day, middle of the week. Uh, our Wednesday show is typically about markets, so happy to have you on. And uh, let's talk, let's start maybe on corn. We did get some numbers this week, uh, or yesterday, I guess. Um, how has the market sort of responded to what they saw? It, it seemed like it wasn't much of a surprise. Yeah, so a yield uh, reduction from the USDA, I think most were anticipating that change. Um, I think what maybe we're still grappling with is the slight increase in the planted acres. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that was expected by most analysts, including myself, uh, based on the FSA uh, surveys that they did the 1st of August. Um, So that increase basically offset a yield decrease. uh, And without adjusting demand, you know, they still gave us a very comfortable carry out projection uh, for the end of the 20, you know, 2023 marketing year. So um, I think that's really how what the market grappled with more so than anything is that we got the yield decline that we anticipated, uh, but still have enough sitting around. Mm-hmm. And so now how many adjustments between or do we see now going forward? Like when will be the next sort of update? 
So we'll get an uh, USDA report in the middle of October, and they can certainly adjust yield and or demand at that point in time, uh, as they can in subsequent you know, November, December reports. Uh, the next big key numbers, I think, we won't get until the middle of January. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where we, we tend to get a lot of those final acre adjustments, those kind of fine, I say final, I'm going to use that loosely, but uh, the final yield and supply side changes for the year, uh, not till January. So that really means from now until then, a lot of, you know, kicking the can, I like to call it, uh, a lot of the market debating whether or not the yield that's currently being used by the USDA is is correct or not. I, it is, I like that you use the term, you know, loosely in that these numbers get adjusted for a long time, right? But it's as mm-hmm. we gather that, you know, export data and, you know, final figures and work that all in. So, I mean, this is what, this is why we can talk about markets every day because there's, there's always right. something getting worked in there. So there you go. Uh, right. So it wasn't a huge surprise. Now, within, you know, sort of what you view, um, there, there was the, you know, the yield decline, but there was also that acreage bump. Do you think there's a, a lot more room for that acreage number to move or are we sort of in the ballpark? I think we're in the ballpark, according to if you look at history and, and how much those numbers have been adjusted the last few years based on that kind of FSA survey at the beginning of August. Um, I think that had suggested, just looking at history, had suggested somewhere in the high 94s to 95. So at 94.9 yesterday, I think that's probably where it needs to be. Probably doesn't need to go a whole lot bigger than that. Um, so, so I don't see a ton of revisions on the acre side going forward, personally. All right. Okay. Let's uh, switch gears a little, talk a little bit about soybeans. How do those numbers come out? So a slight bump in bean planted acres, again, as to be expected there, if you look at kind of history, um, they also reduced the bean yield to 50.1. That probably wasn't as big of a decrease as the trade had anticipated. Uh, So that maybe is where we got some of that negative price reaction in the bean market was that, you know, some had thought that'd be in the uh, 48, 49 number. Uh, so at 50.1, that's still uh, bigger than some had feared. Um, on the flip side of that, though, they they still had to reduce the demand side of the equation uh, to still be able to print us a 220 million bushel bean carryout. So 220 on the surface looks comfortable, looks okay, it looks status quo, right? Um, but if you if you're if you're bullish, which you know depends on where you stand, right? But if you're bullish and you want to say, oh, man, they had to they had to reduce the demand side to still manage to print a two twenty, uh, that makes you think that maybe price has to be a part of that equation. Mm-hmm. Which of these two? Because I mean, we can talk about wheat if you really want to. Which one are you perhaps more excited about? Are you more excited about the soybean side for this coming winter as far as price goes? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of the story to be written yet for both corn and beans, um, especially on the bean side of things with the importance of the South American crop. Um, the I like to call it the tightness of the North, North American crop, the fact that there just isn't a whole lot of room for error, as I would say. Um, a slight demand tweak makes us sit in a very comfortable position mm-hmm. or a very uncomfortable position. Um, so with that uncertainty uh, in mind, I think the market stays a little bit more on edge, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So now I did want to mention, so Bailey, you were here in Canada last week uh, for Savita's field day and we got to meet there, which was really nice. It's, it's great to to sort of make those connections. Um, and, and so you bring up South America Right now, it, it does seem to be one of those conversations that, you know, it always comes up, of course. We, it's a competitor as far as soybeans go, um, you know, who's buying Brazilian beans, these sorts of things. Where where does Brazil fit in in this picture right now? But going forward, how closely should we, should we be watching what Brazil's doing with production? I I can't stress enough the importance that South America plays now 
in the world supply and demand picture for both corn and beans. Uh, They have overtaken the U.S. as the number one exporter. So not only their production and their weather scenarios, what's their political landscape look like? What does their international relationship uh, landscape look like? Uh, So having a, a more robust understanding of the situations going on in mainly, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay uh, is becoming more and more important every day. Mm-hmm. Now, to dig into this a little, and and I think it is, I think it's important that, you know, for all export markets that, that we keep tabs on sort of production and where things are going, whatever. Are we, and we've certainly seen recently, you know, these countries, the BRICS, sort of adding or potentially adding to to that uh, group that are, you know, perhaps maybe not the best of friends, but maybe making closer relations. Uh, you know, we often hear, I think, as pushback that, you know, Brazil doesn't have the logistics it needs. You know, it's there's all these reasons not to consider it maybe as big a player. But as the numbers bear out, yes, they have become that. Is that, do you think, set to increase? Like, is this something that we can't, we can't sort of ignore? I would completely agree. I I just don't think we can ignore it any longer, Uh, especially when you start to talk about, uh, again, that expansion of their international relationships, their ties to some other big commodity importing countries, talking China, talking Russia, things like that. As they continue to increase those ties and, and better those relationships, I think it's more and more vital for us in North America to make sure we're aware of, of what their crop looks like, what's their export potential going to be, uh, and, and how does that impact our prices here in North America? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Bailey, thank you so much. Uh, you are on Twitter. Where can people find you on Twitter if they want to track you down? Yeah, at Bailey Elsinger on Twitter. Uh, last name is E-L-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. That's right. Bailey E, as we learned. All right. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, All right, Bailey, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. And with that, we do wrap up today's show. It has been absolutely just, I've learned a lot, which is always good. Um, I'm hoping that you have too. If you've got any feedback on today's show, by all means, you can zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. You can find all of our coverage at realagriculture.com. You can find our audio, you can download our podcasts, uh, you can read all of our news and all those sorts of good things there. You can, of course, also find us and follow us all across social media. We're on TikTok. We're on X. We're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, you name it. We're there. So absolutely go and check us out. Uh, and if you've got any ideas for the show, any anything that you'd like to have covered or someone you think would make a great interview, uh, just zip us a line and let us know. We love to get your feedback. And of course, we want to be covering what you want to hear. All right. Uh, thank you, of course, to Steve, Denise, uh, to Matt, to Greg Cherwick, and of course, to Bailey for joining me today on today's show. Um, it, it's Absolutely a joy to do this show and a lot of fun. Uh, on tomorrow's show, of course, you'll hear that Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. And on Friday, I'm actually hosting again, uh, but uh, Sean Haney promises me that he's going to join us on the panel. So he will make an appearance, of course, but I'm going to be handling the show uh, sort of overall. But uh, we've got Megan Murdoch lined up for the panel. Of course, Kelvin Hepner as well. And as promised, uh, Sean Haney. And on Friday's show as well, you're going to hear that beef market update with Anne Wasco. And we'll get uh, the latest on what's happening in the cattle markets as well. All right. That does it for me. I thank you again so much. I am Lindsay Smith. uh, And we'll talk to you again on Friday. Cheers, everybody.